Hello, friends. My name is Mark Biernat, and I'm a monetary economist. And in this video, we're going to talk about the resource curse, specifically the resource curse as it applies to Russia and the future of Russia. Now, the resource curse is known as the Dutch disease or the paradox of plenty. And initially, let's uh, last night, I was filming this in front of the Castile de San Marco, the, the fort in St. Augustine, which is made of coquina that the Spanish built in the age of wooden ships and iron men, when the conquistadors came here looking for gold and resources. There's an expression that the conquistadors had by Diaz, we came to serve God and to get rich, as all men want to do. So that was a little bit of their motto, to gather these resources, and I was going to draw a metaphor. But the problem was, big crowds started to circle around me, not in a negative way, maybe even in a positive way. They were just curious to see what I had to say. There was just too much pressure on me, so I'm back here. And with that note, I've, I've heard things moving back here, so if you see anything moving, I don't want to be one of these YouTubers that, you know, have fame for a different reason. But I'm back here in the peace and quiet of the forest, still in St. Augustine. And I want to discuss this resource curse that the Spanish were under and how it applies to Russia currently. A resource curse has, it's a curse, and ironically, it has six, yes, the number six characteristics. It has tyranny, corruption, low development, it's plagued with conflict. It has a Gini coefficient that has gone sideways. And it lacks the diversification of resources. So Russia has all those check marks, as did Spain. St. Augustine was the capital of New Spain and in the New World. The Spanish Empire eventually disintegrated because of this resource curse. The Anglo-American model the nation of shopkeepers, industry, and innovation and farms thrived and succeeded. And you can compare the two influences, geopolitical influences and economic power today. Now, Spain had its day. I mean, even the Spanish pieces of eight were initially used as American currency, as trusted currency. And the legacy of that was the stock market was for a long time quoted in eighths. Some of you might remember that. But essentially, the Spanish Empire started to erode from within. Because with the resource curse, a lot of productive energy of humans and, and uh, their pursuit, their mental activity, is concerned with the acquisition of an unproductive asset. Gold is an unproductive asset. Believe it or not, oil and gas is an unproductive asset because that in and of itself doesn't create something. The human mind, there's a correlation that creates something. There's a correlation between countries with a lot of resources and wealth and few resources and wealth. And you know which way that goes. I mean, the countries with the least wealth have to depend on their intelligence and their mind in order to succeed. I'll give you an example from nature, an anthropomorphic maybe example, but it's interesting. The Spanish also brought a lot of uh, pigs here. And many of them escape cultivation and domestication. And they run wild all through these woods. Even here, you might see them in this video. I just saw something move and escape just now. These are not traditional boars, but the one thing you know about these pigs in the wild, they're extremely clever. In the scale of human animal development, I think chimpanzees, dolphins, and, and wild pigs are all very comparable. The domesticated pigs, the pigs that are not having to strive and being innovative to survive, tend to be less intelligent. Now that doesn't mean they can't be intelligent, it's just that, that the culture that they're put in. So the more metaphor extends to the resource curse. When you have opportunities in a free market and in capitalism, you know, you really have to think on your feet and innovate. When you're in a system that has put you in this feudal caste system, 
and your hope is very little except to maybe just slightly incrementally better your life, you're not thinking outside of the box because there's no reason to, because there's no hope. So let's talk about the downfall of Russia based on the resource curse. I want to explain the resource curse in a microeconomic way so you'll be able to understand this. And again, the metaphor with the anthropomorphic pigs has nothing to do with people specifically at all. In fact, we want to make this world a better place. It has to do with the environment that they're placed in. Okay, so, I, uh, and I'm not making any commentary on intelligence either, but just an observation about survival. Okay, so the microeconomic foundation is this. If somebody in your county or state or province or even city discovers gold or a large amount of natural resources under their land, do you personally benefit from that? Do you get rich? Chances are no. Chances are, you know, that person and maybe their few collective friends and associates will. And in a relative sense, you will be poor. So to make the claim that Russia has vast natural resources and it's a rich country, which I often hear, is incorrect thinking, economic thinking. Because only as we know, the G between the tyranny and the despotism that uh, goes along with this Gini coefficient of the resource curse, only a few people benefit. The rest are relatively worse off, actually. So this is the, think about it again, ask yourself again, if somebody in your town discovers a pot of gold or wins something, you know, through a windfall, does that make you personally rich? Even if there's a minuscule trickle down effect. So most of Russia's history with this resource curse has been that of lives of quiet desperations. And in the words from their own literature, dead souls, unfortunately. Because their objective here is to improve Russia, is to make Russia a better place so we can live in a world of peace. Because, because this conflict connected with the resource curse is quite annoying to say the least. So what happened to Spain? Spain disintegrated, New Spain disintegrated. And people made the claim, look how large Spain is, look how many resources Spain is. But look at South America, they're all separate little countries. And the best way to improve Russia and make it a better place is sever the link between the resources. If Russia does not have resources to, to rely on as a crutch, they have to use the, the most, the greatest God-given resource in the universe, the human brain, to innovate, to create. Look at all the value added through intellectual, intellectual property that is contributing to the growth in the West, such as Google or YouTube and platforms. This is an amazing innovation, platforming and non-intangible goods, which, which are propelled by intellect, uh, an intellectual property. That is how developed nations go. You're not just farming and mining. Okay, farming and mining only gets you so far. And, you know, if you rely on it, desperately as your choice to run your economy, it does horrible damage to the environment. It's this lack of diversification. Remember the six points of the resource curse, tyranny, check mark. Okay, Russia has it. Corruption, check mark, Russia has it. Low growth, check mark, Russia has it. Conflict, check mark, Russia has it. A sideways Gini coefficient, check mark, Russia has it. And lack of diversification, check mark, Russia has it. So how is this going to fall? First of all, it's already falling. Because if you've ever studied Russian history, you know a lot of it is bluffing. Okay? They're always projecting image of power and strength. That's all they'll project. But behind the scenes, something else is going on. And there's a few ways it can fall. It can fall from an accounting standpoint, a monetary standpoint, a physical standpoint, and a metaphysical standpoint. And it will liberate itself from this resource curse. And the world will become a better place. The accounting standpoint is just simply the numbers. 
In Moscow, they have banked about three hundred billion, uh, and or smaller or less, in their chest for this geopolitical event. When that runs out, estimated on the burn rate in twenty twenty six, they're going to have to print money and monetize everything, which will eventually will increase the chaos in the system, and lead eventually to the fall. Now, what about the monetary way? Well, the last time. The ruble was backed by gold. It started in 1898. My grandparents were around, and ended in 1914. That's it. They've made claims to a Russian-backed gold system, and bricks, and digital currency. And I'll maybe handle that in a different video. But these claims are unfounded. It's just paper right now, and they're trying to use currency controls and other back office methods to fictitiously prop up the value of the ruble. But when that ruble consistently is below one pen, penny against the U.S. dollar, that will have a significant impact on their ability to generate revenue from their resource curse, their oil and gas revenue. And so you watch the ruble. You watch it in the next several months. It's gone below a penny, and they did emergency techniques to prop it up. But I'm skeptical if they'll be able to do this in the future. Now, the physical way is an interesting way. It's the Eastern Siberian Pacific Ocean Pipeline. It's the artery that supplies the lifeline of revenue to Russia currently through selling it to Asia, specifically China. The physical way is: what if the pipeline accidentally gets severed? Okay. The issue here is if it accidentally gets severed, unlike refineries which are being vaporized, the the actual pipeline can be repaired. But it's not out of the question, and I'm surprised it's called the ESPO. I'm surprised more people have not talked about the ESPO and the physical severance of that. If that is severed in a meaningful way, the impact would be immediate. I'm not suggesting it. I'm not recommending it. I'm just from a observer. The downside would be tremendous environmental impact, and nobody wants that. Believe it or not, even under these conditions. But we'll see what happens with that, and I'd like to see your input of why the e、uh, ESPO. I almost want to say something else, like this sports sports thing. That link is not severed. The last thing is this metaphysical. So I talked about the accounting, the monetary, the physical. The, what about the metaphysical? Now I'm not a supernaturalist per se, although I'm I have, I'm a person of faith. But I do believe in karma, and I do believe, and maybe this will be another video, in the power of myth. Joseph Campbell. The mythology that good wins over evil, light over the darkness. It happens all the time. Many people in my class point out. Well, they say crime is the way to go. Crime isn't the way to go. You know, in just in a thought experiment, is it a good way to go? The richest people I know personally are altruistic, charitable, and are not. They usually make it in some innovative, creative way. As much as people like to paint it this way or that, and even, but I'm talking about, and, and even like this business and financially, you could argue it either way. In a substantial way, Russia is not a good actor. It's been creating immense negative karma through the years, and I don't believe the universe will allow that conti to continue. So any way you slice it, this resource curse has been a curse on Russia. People argued initially it was from the Mongolian invasion in the 1200s, and that's why they're so despotic. No, it's connected to resource curse. And when that ends, the world will be a better place and be transformed. You will see, because without a Russia aggravating a despotic resource curse, Russia aggravating so many points, whether it be in Asia or the Middle East. Then at least this world will have a chance. This planet will have a chance to work together. So think of ways 
Everybody can put them in the comment that we can end this resource curse to make the world a better place, specifically connected to Russia. Again, only in a positive way. I believe it will end in monetary disaster through the ruble. And it will happen fairly rapidly. So let's keep our eye on the ruble. My name is Mark Birnot, and I'm a monetary economist. Thank you very much and have a great day.